Hi guys, it is Tuesday, April 14th. That's right, April 14th. Welcome to our next lesson in post-war America. We are looking at the Cold War. Uh, Last week, we took a look at what was going on at home, uh, looking at sort of the return to normalcy, the, the, the post-war boom, the rise of suburbia, uh, all of that stuff. Look at some of the challenges to the conformity that, that uh, occurred during that time period with the, the whole notion of rock and roll and Elvis. And as we look at post-war America, and, and it's impossible to just look at things at home or to look at them abroad, right? It's all happening together. And so today, we talk about understanding uh, how this Cold War originated, right? And and obviously there's an ideological difference between uh, American capitalism and Soviet communism, right? Put some no. Like, what, what I did for today was uh, put together a Google Doc that's, you know, <coughs> got a bunch of notes, sorry. You don't have to do anything. There's no written work for today. But again, like as we sort of like move forward and look at this time period in American history, um, just like we started with Duck and Cover, Everything that happens at home falls under the context of this Cold War, and it shapes our foreign policy from 1945, you know, all the way up to 1990. I mean, like, if we were in class right now, I'd be sharing with you that when I was in elementary school in the middle 1980s, um, made the mistake of sleeping over at a friend's house who had HBO, parents didn't have HBO, didn't love me, and uh, watched an R-rated movie, Red Dawn, right, where the Soviet paratroopers... Uh, come down outside of school and then they blow everybody away with their AKs. And so here I am, 10 years old, sitting in the back of the room at Foster and I'm staring out at the field like legitimately terrified that Soviet paratroopers are going to come down, right? And, and, and that's the mid-80s, right? So this stuff lasts and shapes our foreign policy for quite some time. So we want to understand you know, how this originates, how containment originates. So give you a few notes on like, you know, it's dry stuff, like the ideological differences um, but then what's really important is the post-war goals that emerge. The Soviets get their teeth kicked in. 20 million people, you see estimates that say 25, even 30 million Russians died during the war. As you saw what the Germans did when they rolled east. You saw what happened at Leningrad, right? No surrender, 900 days, right? 2 million people killed there. Um, the Soviet Union is destroyed. Um, the United States is largely untouched. Uh, you know, we, we don't have the war fought on our own soil and we have half of the world's wealth uh, when the war ends. And we have very different goals. The Soviet Union has one goal. The Sovs want security, right? They don't trust the West and they don't want to have another invasion. They just paid the ultimate price in the great patriotic war. So they want, they want security, right? They want to create a buffer and make sure the West, which has always been ideologically opposed to them. I mean, we didn't even recognize them until the 1930s. We helped the White Army during the Russian Revolution. I mean, it was, it was a token help, but you know, we certainly did not want the Reds to win. And, and as we have these different goals, the Red, you know, the, the, the Sovs want security and we want to build Europe back up, right? We want democratic Western governments that will allow us access to those markets again. And, and this sort of intro ends with, you know, the great Winston Churchill speech. He's touring North America. And rather than Harry Truman break it to the American people that Uncle Joe Stalin's not our friend anymore, uh, Winston Churchill speaking at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. You know, I, I put a video clip and he says, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. And it's an ominous speech, right? Um, you know, it calls it uh, a challenge to Christian civilization, right? This is not the Europe that we liberated, nor does it contain the seeds for eventual peace. So then we get into containment, right? Which is checking Soviet expansion. It's not, let's go toe to toe nuclear combat with the Ruskies, uh, but rather let's check their expansion. And, and it starts off with how did we arrive at that? And it talks about how the Sovs, you know, stabbed us in the back at Yalta. We really weren't in a position to dictate terms at Yalta. We got a, 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 a token pledge from Stalin to have free and fair elections um, in Eastern Europe, which the Red Army occupied. And as you will see, uh, a Soviet-style free election comrade is not necessarily that free. Sorry, bias comes out, like I said, child of the Cold War, right? I'm watching WrestleMania 3 booing Nikolai Volkov. Cannot get that out of my head. Sorry. 
Uh, and then we look at the Kennan Report, which really shapes the policy of containment, where uh, George Kennan's our top diplomat in Russia, and Washington cables him and is like, George, what's up? What, why are the Soviets opposing us? Why are they getting in the way of every last thing that we want to do in Europe? And Kennan, as he says, he's like 90 years old. He's like, ah! And he's like, you got to give me some space. He, he writes 10,000 words. That's a lot of words. Uh, his famous long telegram published in Foreign Affairs magazine where he says, listen, man, these people are no good. These are the people that sold us out to the Nazis. Like, you've forgotten that. The Soviet Union is looking to expand and we have to be ready to do everything we can to check them. And that's where we get the Truman Doctrine the next year in 1947. Uh, Greece and Turkey are a mess, as all of Europe is a mess. It looks as if communist factions might come to power. Uh, you know, hey, rule Britannia. Britain's broke. They got nothing. And so Truman goes up to the Congress, which, you know, as the video describes, is still often isolationist. And, and says, look, like the free people of the world are looking to us for leadership. We need these $400 million to make sure that these countries stay free. And this is, this is the defining moment where he pitches this, you know, any struggle around the world between capitalism and communism is freedom versus tyranny, right? It's good guys versus the bad guys. It's, it's good versus evil, right? Um, and, and Congress says, yeah. Here's $400 million. Prop up the government of Greece. Prop up the government of Turkey. Don't let the Sovs instill a communist dictatorship. Then we move on and we look at containment in Europe. We look at three events. And all these video clips are super short, right? I'm sorry if you see it choppy. Well, I'm kind of limited teaching here at home. So I'm, I'm trying to make sure you understand the most important things. Like why does the Cold War start and this notion of containment and how do we practice it? And we see the Marshall Plan, right, where famed um, author John Updike says, after the war, the communists held all the cards because wherever there was misery, poverty, deprivation, uh, where can you turn? Communism, right? Uh, if you're doing halfway decent and ideology that preaches a classless, properless society has zero appeal to you. Um, and there was a real fear that if Europe did not recover economically, uh, you know, the... Communism had an appeal. So we spend, right, $15 billion, right, the European Economic Recovery Act, and we we rebuild Europe so that communism doesn't look appealing. We offer it to the Sobs, and they're like, you know, yet. And, and, and it further drives a wedge because, you know, Stalin sees this for what it is, which is us trying to undermine, you know, the, any chance of communism spreading. Um, then we, you know, we almost have World War III in 1948 with the Berlin airlift where Stalin wants us out of West Berlin. West Berlin's 110 miles inside of East Germany. Um, and to try to get us out, he blockades it. And there's people that want to go to war, people that want to pull out. But luckily we had Harry S. Truman as president that came up with another way. Uh, it also changes the way that the West Germans view us. And, um, probably know West Berlin's kind of a big deal, right? Uh, President Kennedy, right? Let them come to Berlin, ich bin an Berliner. Um, and then of course, uh, President Reagan, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, t open this gate, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. So we see the importance of West Berlin. And then finally, um, as a result of Stalin's aggression in West Berlin, we violate George Washington's farewell address where he said, no foreign alliances, permanent foreign alliances. And we start our ever our first ever peacetime alliance, which is still very relevant today. And that would be NATO, originally named NATO, the North Atl North East Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, but you know, I don't think the Sovs would have been scared by a military alliance called NATO. So we changed it to just NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So read the doc, put all the notes in there, put the video clips in there, and um, this is what day is this? This is Tuesday. Wednesday's a review day. Thursday, Friday, you look at containment in Asia where we lock horns with the Ruskies uh, in Korea and we'll spend two days taking a look at that stuff. See you.